Welcome back to another episode of Rewiring Health. Very excited to be joined by Rita Trotter today. So thank you for being here, Rita. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, absolutely. So I want to just jump right in because what I love is just hearing people's journeys because that's just the most profound thing, how like life just takes you on this journey. You never know where it's going to go. Do you mind just sharing your journey and what brought you to what you do today and who you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a women's body transformation coach and I work with women over the age of 40, essentially to not just lose fat, but create um, a body shape that they love, a body that they can look in the mirror. And for a lot of them, for the first time ever, really accept and love it. And equally, a lot of that focuses on balancing hormones, a lot of challenges with perimenopause and menopause. And it all really stemmed from my own experience of gaining 70 pounds in weight and having no clue what to do about it. Um, I, you know, as a kid, teenager, I really struggled with anorexia and a very poor body image, uh, mainly because of things that kids said at school, because of, you know, small, I, in today's world, we call it banter, but these small little flippant comments. Yeah. And then as I sort of matured through my 20s, I never really thought about my weight I didn't have to mm -hmm. I I did all of the wrong things I ate a lot of takeaways I ate a lot of pizzas I drank a lot I stayed up late but my body on the outside never really changed and then I got pregnant with my first child and suddenly 70 pounds came on my hormones were all over the place and when I started trying to find something that would work I did what most women have done. And I tried every fad diet, yo-yoing, um, none of them were sustainable. And then I sort of looked for trainers and everyone was either <laughs> a 21 year old, you know, very fit young woman, which is great, but she had no clue what it was like to have kids or have hormonal imbalances, or it was a man with a bicep the same size as my leg so <laughs> again it was quite an intimidating prospect um and I just couldn't really find anything that worked for me my lifestyle my time constraints and also my level of confusion you know there's a lot of people out there who are great but they don't explain to you okay an egg is protein like they just don't really talk to you about the basic stuff um so yeah that's kind of where it started for me was wanting to help women who didn't have time didn't understand their bodies didn't understand their hormones and pretty much their entire life was about other people kids husband family business clients and there was no time for them because that was kind of where I found myself yeah, I love that. And I it's such an important place to be and and to help people in that category because I mean I can understand it like before kids like it, your body feels different and then after kids there's so many things you're like well, that's different that's not what I'm used to and it's like that adjustment and you're kind of like left on your own almost to kind of figure it out and there's also that like kind of shame and blame game where you see all these like celebrities that like oh we lost all our weight in in you know a week or two and it's like it's not reality but to understand how to adapt to that I just love what you do and one thing that I love is the simplicity of it because I think we're bombarded with information all the time and it's like we don't know how to take that we get overwhelmed and then it's like then we put the blame on ourselves. well like what's wrong with me there's all these things that make it look simple but it's not really and I just love what you do is that you take it all together and you you make it a simple program where people can implement it and I, I just love that absolutely simplicity is key so I've been asked on too many occasions that I can't count anymore you know what what do you get mm -hmm. and my response is always well if you work with me or any other coach worth their salt mm -hmm. you get results mm -hmm. I'm not really fussed about over complicated workout plans mm -hmm. and meal plans as long as your arm mm -hmm. or you know a ton of supplements and pills and all of because essentially we're now in such a consumer society that people want stuff to do it for them. 
Mm-hmm. I want to, I'll spend 10 grand on, you know, stuff or a surgeon to do this because I know exactly, you know, what the materialistic stuff is going to be. But actually, when it comes to body or health in any aspect, it doesn't matter how you get there. Mm-hmm. It's about getting the result. And for me, it's about, well, rather than giving you a hundred things and 99 of them won't work, but one might, let's just do one thing that has massive effect yeah. and ensure that that's the right thing for you. Because the last thing that women like us need is more things to do. I mean, your to-do list, I can guarantee everyone listening has a to-do list and they've never managed to complete it. As soon as something gets ticked off, something else goes on. So why would we want to add more and more chores and tasks and have tos? Let's just make it about key simplicity and get a result, regardless of whether it requires just one change or 10. Yeah, I love that. It's it's so crucial because again, especially as a mom and and you know anyone who's in their forties or fifties, whatever, like you, your life is just so chaotic. It's like the last thing you want is another job, you know, where you have to like yeah. have things just like he, a, a huge load put on your shoulders again. So I I love that that simplicity because I feel like it's very empowering when you approach it from that standpoint where you're like, okay, give me something I can do. I can see that I'm doing it, and now then you can build on that. Versus like I feel like so many programs bombard you with all these changes and then it kind of backfires because you're so overwhelmed by it. So I, I love that concept. One thing that really struck struck me about you, because I, 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 you know, read, I kind of, I do my research with anyone I have on, but one thing I loved is how you talk about the typical cultures move more, eat less, and that's it. And, and I find that puts a lot of blame on the person like, well, what's wrong with you? Can't you just eat less and you move more? And what I love about what you do is that you, you flip the script, like you don't put the blame on the person for their inability to lose weight, you empower them to do it. So can you just talk about that, how you empower people to move past that, that concept that it's so widely thrown in our faces? Absolutely. So the eat less, move more idea from a scientific perspective makes sense. I get it. From an evidence, personal training, fitness trainer perspective, it makes sense. But there's one fundamental question that's being missed, which is, well, if it's that simple, why aren't people doing it? And the why is what I'm interested in. And the why is what I want to talk to people about. Because If we are sedentary for 20 out of a 24 hour day, why? If we are eating a plate of food that's, you know, the size of our head, or, you know, if we're eating so much food, why? If we're finding ourselves standing at the vending machine every hour, you know, getting snacks or chips crisps in the UK but chips for you guys Mm -hmm. uh chocolate bars whatever it might why Mm -hmm. and everything that we do like everything is based on how we feel so we all have sort of basic human needs but it fundamentally comes down to a feeling whether that's stress anger overwhelm guilt shame fear all of these feelings lead to choices and often these are feelings that people don't want to feel I've never met someone that goes, yeah, I want to feel afraid. Mm -hmm. I want to feel guilty. I want to feel angry. So what we do is rather than dealing with the feeling, we try to distract or suppress it. And that's where sedentary lifestyle comes in. So we are really stressed at work. So what do we do? We sit in our chair, we stare at our computer and we work more because we might fix the problem. Or we are really nervous about an event or we're scared about an email we've got to write. So we distract by getting up and going to the cookie cupboard or the vending machine. So everything that we, no one wants to harm their body, but we do it if we are fundamentally living in an emotional state that we don't enjoy. So I always say there are three three keys that really make up successful health not just weight loss, but health. And it's strategy, story, and state. Now the strategy is everywhere. A strategy is a diet. 
a fitness program. The strategy is Weight Watchers or Slimming World. There are strategies everywhere, but people don't use them. Why? Because they tell themselves a disempowering story. I can't lose weight because I've never done it, or I'm too busy, or I don't have enough money, or I've always been big boned, or my family's overweight. So we tell ourselves stories, essentially saying that biography equals destiny. And most of the stories that we tell are either disempowering or empowering based on the emotional state that we live in. So people that live in a state of passion and joy and my favorite state, curiosity, tend to find that they eat less and move more because they're just naturally looking for the positive. They're naturally curious about their feelings. They listen to the messages. People that live in a state of overwhelm and anxiety, which unfortunately nowadays is most of society, tend to try and hide, distract, or numb the feelings. And that's where excessive food and lack of movement come in. So yes, it's fundamentally a basic key, but the the reason is we need to understand why I put on 70 pounds because I had 12-year-old girls in my head from when I was a kid saying, you're chubby, you're overweight, you're ugly. And their voices propelled me. It wasn't that I was lazy. I was just living in the wrong emotional state. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I couldn't, I love that because it's so true. But a lot of times we just try to fix everything externally, but our inside is so empty. And it's like, when we talk about our inside and be a, bring awareness to it and all those messages, like you talk about when you're 12 years old, like we all carry messages from our childhood. We have all been through things and we all carry that. But until we bring awareness to that, like, why is that true? Like, why am I holding on to this? Like, and a lot of that is that protective part, part of it is that like, we've gone through things that maybe made us feel less safe or threatened when we were a child. And then we hold on to it because that's what our system does. It's like, well, I'm going to protect you now. And, and it doesn't serve us. It's just protecting us. So I, I love how you do that is like, let's talk about the why, because that's everything. I mean, like you said, there's strategy all around, but until we know what's authentically right for us and why we are doing these behaviors, that's everything. I mean, I, I can attest to that with the eating disorder I had as well. It's like, you know, the behaviors were not the issue is why I was engaging in that. And, and it's with everything. We all have these dialogues that were, that are dictating our life. Our subconscious dictates 90% of our life. So we have to change that. So I love that approach that you, you do. It's so, so crucial. It's amazing. And kind of going yeah. off of that, one thing I would love for you to talk on is how do we, if we struggle with body image, if we struggle with like just that negative self-talk, how do we start to accept ourselves? Like have that self-acceptance for what we look like, for what we feel, everything that's authentically us. How do we start to cultivate that self-acceptance? So for everybody, it can be slightly different, but usually what I find is in this present moment, anybody listening, you, I, are a culmination of all of our past selves. And I, I don't mean past lives or anything like that. I mean, our five-year-old, six, seven, eight, 25, 30-year-old, they all live with us. And often in a moment, we can feel something that doesn't make sense. Like, you know, have you ever felt angry and you're like why do I feel angry this situation doesn't make sense for that and it's because something's usually happened that has triggered one of those past versions of us who isn't at peace and you know I'll the the 12 year old version of me for a long time before I realized she had such control uh, a woman might say something um, to their child in a in a bar or a restaurant, I'd hear it and I'd interfere, not because the current adult me had any opinion on somebody's parenting, but the 12-year-old felt scared and attacked. And suddenly me as this grown woman was acting on the 12-year-old's trigger. Mm -hmm. And often what we need to do to start to really accept ourselves in the present day is to understand which are the key versions of us who haven't healed. We all have versions who have been hurt, 
and that that can be from you know just a bullying word all the way through to abuse there are various you know scales of this but we need to put them at peace otherwise they just continue to tap us like the 21 year old will continue to tap us saying you know you're not good enough you're ugly you know the the 30 year old whose husband cheated on them you know you're not attractive you're not desirable they continue to tap and then have a massive impact on how we react today which is why most people struggle to be present I've I've barely met anyone who truly can be present in the moment because they've got like 50 versions of themselves all screaming and being triggered. So the first thing I would say is look back at key moments in your life that have had a negative impact on you and really imagine what does that version look like? You know, what was the hair looking like? What was the environment? What did they wear? And then imagine how did they feel in that moment? Did they feel scared? Did they feel violated? Did they feel threatened? How did that version of you feel? And then you need to give them what they need. So I always say write a letter as if it was your daughter, your little sister. Write a letter to that version and give them the love, give them the care, give them the peace and acceptance that they needed And then they will be quiet and calm and still so that you today can truly be present and accepting of your life without their trigger or interference. Yeah, I love that. And I love how you give such an actionable step, something that you can really take and, you know, for anyone listening, like do that. And it's, it's like those little things that you may not think are a big difference, make all the difference. And that, that's something I've learned in my healing journey. I'm like, well, what's that going to do? And then you do it and you're like, oh yeah, that really does work. It really (laughs) has such a profound effect on how you think. And I, I just love how you give such an actionable step and to bring awareness to those. It's uncomfortable to bring awareness, but it will help you move forward. And it's like, if you want that dream life, like what, you know, what can you do now? And that's just such a great thing to do is just start looking at the stories that you're telling yourself. So I, I absolutely love that suggestion. And I'm actually reading a book now it's called quantum vibe, but it talks about that, how triggers are, it's, it is a huge message of what's going on internally. So use that to, to bring up your energy levels and understand how you can give yourself compassion. So I love that message that, that you share with that. And it's, it really is so true kind of going off of that, um, when, when like bringing awareness, because again, that's such a big thing. And so many people go through life just like on autopilot. They don't even think about what they're doing. And I know a big part of what you do is that conscious eating. Do you mind just Mm -hmm. talking about that? Like, how do we start to eat consciously? And I know what I love too, about what you do is that you're not a diet, like, like you're not, you're more of like an anti-diet person. Like let's not do something for the short term. Like how can we do this for the long term? So I love that too, but can you kind of talk about that? Why diets don't work and how conscious eating does work? Absolutely. So the reason that we need to clarify diets work short term, Mm -hmm. they do. Mm -hmm. And the reason that the diet industry is so successful is that people nowadays want things now mm-hmm. you know I don't know what it's like in the states but here we've got like our tube system like the metro like the underground system if they have to wait more than one minute for a train that you know they're angry they mm-hmm. you know is this happening you know Amazon Prime <laughs> if it doesn't get delivered the very next day I want to refund. I want to cancel. Right. So we are in a society where we want things instantly, you know, Domino's pizza. And do you have Domino's? In the do. States? Yeah? Mm-hmm. Okay. So Domino's made itself one of the biggest pizza takeaway companies across the planet for one simple reason. It was a tiny, tiny little local place. It wasn't doing very well. And then the owner said, okay, I'll deliver your pizza in less than 30 minutes. If I don't, you get it for free. Mm -hmm. As soon as he realized that he could tap into the convenience speed element, Domino's has never looked back and it's now huge. So we want things now, now, now. But I would always ask anyone listening, if it's taken 20 years to put the weight on, do you really expect it to come off in 20 seconds and stay off? No. 
there are underlying habits and behaviors that have made your body manifest and your choices happen. The weight has come on because of habits that need to be shifted. So the diet industry doesn't work as a long term because it essentially says, let's restrict everything. You're going to be bored. You're going to be hungry. And eventually we then feel so sort of tired of constraining ourselves that we go the opposite direction. So we go all in to then all out. Right. Well, now I've had a chocolate bar. I've ruined the quote unquote diet. I'll have another and another, and then I'll have the takeaway and a bottle of wine, and I'll just start again on Monday. Oh, well, it's almost the end of the month. I'll start again on the first and so on. Conscious eating is essentially the awareness of why you're doing what you're doing, what you're eating, and what's the reason. So I, even when I'm training for a fitness competition and I have a six pack and you know all of the muscles on show I'll still have a chocolate bar or a pizza that doesn't make you put on weight it's the guilt that I've now eaten something that is bad that then causes excessive eating that then causes the problem so conscious eating is just being aware of why am I eating it it's okay all food is nutrition all food is good. And as long as I'm not doing it to mask an emotion, and I'm doing it just because in this moment, it's pleasurable, and I can move on. Great. That's how you live a healthy life and maintain a healthy weight It's not by never having sugar again, it's by having it consciously enjoying it in the moment. and moving on not dwelling on it for the next 48 hours of your life. So I'd always say every time you pick up anything, whether it's grilled chicken or McDonald's, just think in your mind, why? Am I doing this to hide something, to mask something, to numb something, even boredom? The number of women who are bored out of their mind at work, and so they eat to alleviate the boredom. If you're doing it through boredom, what could you do that would alleviate the boredom, that would serve you, that wouldn't be food? If you are angry and you're eating because of that, what could you do to understand that message? Because any feeling is telling us to do one of two things, change your behavior or change your belief. So if I feel angry, right, do I need to change my behavior in this moment? Usually it's because I need to change my belief about what somebody else is doing or why they're doing it. So as long as we start to consciously be aware of why we're eating, it's much easier to stay in control of it rather than it being reaction. Most of us eat out of reaction. Yeah, yeah, so many amazing things you just said there. The one thing I love that you said is how it's like, how that culture is that, you know, when you start dieting, it's like that restricted restriction. And then you like, can't live like that forever because it's just, it's draining. And that's what willpower is. It's like willpower will drain you. If you feel like you have to use strictly willpower all the time, like it's good to get you going, but it's not good long-term because it does take energy to use willpower. So when you start bringing in like that, like love for yourself and that compassion for yourself and not feeling like you're coming down on yourself for every single thing you put in your mouth. Like, I love that because again, like we are our own worst critics. And then once we start getting into those patterns of like self-loathing, like we're setting ourselves up for just more anguish down the road. And so I, I love that, that switch of like, okay, how can we do this and still enjoy the, the chocolate bar? Like you're saying, it's like, you know, especially when you're working on a competition, it's like, that's a very strict period, but you can still give yourself grace to allow yourself to have that and then not punish yourself for it. So, so I love that. And one thing too, that really stuck out to me was that how you talk about, you know, we use food to fill those emotional voids and like, and that self numbing and the coping mechanisms. And it's like, we, 
we all have them to some extent, but like, what are you using it for? And it is for some people, it is food for some people, it's alcohol for some people, it's scrolling through social media for some people it's TV. So it's like being aware of like, how are you using these? And, and all those are okay, but what's the purpose for it? So very, very true just to bring awareness to that and have that in, in your daily routine of like, why are you doing that? So I, I love that because it's all like small little things. Like you're, you know, we started out with simplicity. It's all what you talk about. These are little simple things that change just the tiniest thing, but change everything for the, the big picture. So I, I love that. It's amazing. Um, do you mind sharing, uh, because I, I always love, you know, stories are the biggest thing. Do you mind sharing a story of someone who you worked with, who maybe was came to you struggling and went through those like yo-yo dieting and, you know, uh, just coming down on themselves, very negative about themselves, and then really saw a huge life change in inside and out. Do you mind just sharing something that someone you've helped in that way? Yeah, of course. So, you know, there's so many women who are pretty much in that situation, but I guess one client that comes to mind is Emily. Um, so Emily was 45. She had two teenage children, um, both of whom disabled, so need full-time care. We're talking about, you know, two 15 year old, well, 13 and 15. And she was also the vice president of an international bank. So, you know, not a small job. And, she had struggled for years with weight pretty much since her first child so 15 years mainly because when you're trying to juggle a job like that two children that at this stage for most people those kids should be completely independent they shouldn't really need that's that's when we say this is my time right for her that wasn't her time and she went on a holiday to Dubai with her um husband and it should have been this beautiful getaway they managed to get carers in and it should have been just a week of pure bliss and all she did for an entire week was look at other women mm -hmm. and compare herself and resent it mm -hmm. she would look around and say well they've got kids why do they look like that and I don't or look at her. I wonder if she's got children. I wonder if she looks like that. And that was, so she completely missed a holiday. She spent thousands on holiday and wasn't even there mentally. And that's when, and one of the biggest things that we had to work on, well, there were so many, but the very first key was there's no such thing as I don't have time to move. Because most people go, well, I don't have an hour to go to the gym or I don't have two hours to go and play sports or whatever it might be. Well, I said, after this, this was our very first call. Do you have five minutes? And she went, well, I've got 10 minutes between this and my next meeting. I said, all right, what can you do in 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. I said, what can you do? And so she did like a little 10 minute YouTube dance video thing. And that was probably the start of her understanding that 10 minutes is all you need to get momentum, right? Because if you imagine like Indiana Jones and the big ball, the ball to get it to move takes a lot of effort. But once it's going, once it's going, it's going and it's easy. So it's, it's like, have you got five minutes? Have you got three minutes to just do something? And then in terms of the comparison, it was actually about at this point, realizing that it wasn't her 45 year old self again that was sort of comparing it was the words of her mother so her mother had always said oh well your friends are slim your sister is slim so a lot of the women I work with um you know I guess not surprisingly are twins mm -hmm. and they've been compared with their sister throughout their life and they are quote unquote, the big one, or the jolly one, or the chubby one. And again, so she was hearing these words, she had thoughts saying, you're not as slim as her. And I said, well, whose voice is it? Is it yours? And she went, I guess. And I was like, okay, let's take it back. When was the first time you can remember hearing those words? And it was her mother at the age of seven. So one of the biggest 
challenges mentally that we overcame was understanding that all of these beliefs that you have, these negative self-talks, aren't yours. They're words from somebody else that you've taken on. So guess what? Give it back. Mm -hmm. Just give it. They're not your words. They're not your beliefs. They're somebody else's that you've adopted. Give it back and fill it with your words. Mm -hmm. So there were there were lots of things that we changed, but the the just five minutes and whose words are they were probably the two things that she resonated with. And in just three months, she lost um, in pounds, it was like 28 pounds in three months, um, and then continued with all the tools to lose the rest of her weight, I think it was another 40 pounds in the next six months. Um, and she's now, you know, sustaining it um, with ease, just because we looked at those fundamentals. Wow. That's everything. And I, I love that, that five minutes, because I, especially when you're like a high achiever, you're trying to do so many things. You think like it's all or nothing. I either do an hour or I do nothing and just yeah. bringing it back like five minutes. It's so true. We can all find five minutes in our day and to see those results and just changing those little things, but that makes all the difference. And I just, I love that. And just, you know, sharing that story. Thank you for sharing that because it's like hearing that. And for anyone listening, like when you hear those stories, you're like, okay, it's, it is doable. It's possible. Like you, you, everyone is empowered enough to do that. You just have to kind of find that inner strength in yourself. And, mm -hmm. and it's so true to stop comparing yourself and criticizing yourself. And how can we start changing those C's that we use to compassion and, <laughs> And uh, yeah, I just love that. Thank you for sharing that. And kind of just wrapping up here, do you, um, for someone who wanted to like work with you and learn more about what you do, where can they find you? So um, our website is thehealthandfitnesscoach.com. Um, I'm on social media. So the health and fitness coach or Rita Trotter, you can find us on um facebook linkedin instagram but probably the best place to go is the website first i will give people a breakdown of different programs you know different client stories emily's on there as well um so you know go and have a little look around and you can always email us as well which is uh support at the health and fitness coach .co.uk um even if it's just to ask a question or guidance i'm always happy to have a chat Awesome. Thank you. I'll put everything in the show notes too, for anyone listening so they can find you. And, and also Rita has a podcast too. So definitely check out her podcast as well. So if you want to just talk about your podcast podcast quickly. Yeah, of course. So we have uh, the health collective, which is mainly aimed at sort of women in careers and business and really just looking at various different tips. Obviously, Kelly, you're a fantastic guest talking about um, our sort of nervous system. And mm -hmm. it's just really helping women understand the various different aspects of life that go into creating an extraordinary one, you know, not just in body, but in energy, in focus, in mindset. Um, so yeah, the health collective. Yeah, great. So definitely check that out. I, it's a great podcast. You have so many amazing guests and and I just love what you share. And it's just that empowering message. Again, everything that you've talked about today, it's like, hopefully anyone listening to this, you take away that you're not, that you are so worthy and you're not, you're you're not stuck. You know, that that's a big thing. You're not stuck on where you are. You can always change. And if you feel like you've been going through this cycle of just like, quote unquote, failing yourself. Maybe if you start working the inside out, that's where that true key is to creating the change that you love and that you want in your life. So thank you for sharing everything that you share, because it's just such an important message. It's something I wish I heard 20 years ago because I was that person. And so to understand that we have to start loving ourselves and giving ourselves compassion is such a better way than to come down on ourselves for what we aren't. So thank you, Rita. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everyone for listening. And yeah, hopefully together we've added some value to at least one person's life. Absolutely. I, I'm, I guarantee that. And thank you again, same for everyone for listening. And, and if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the podcast and um, please share any reviews or comments you have about this episode. So thank you very much.